As always, today's podcast is sponsored by Fire Facilities, makers of reliable, all-American steel fire training structures built the way you train. Fire Facilities towers, burn rooms, and mobile units help you prepare to respond and survive. Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter. Today's guest is Dr. Graham Peasley. Now, Dr. Peasley is a professor at the University of Notre Dame who has worked with the fire service for over four years to help remove PFAS exposure sources from both AFFF usage and turnout gear. And you probably know Dr. Graham Peasley from the documentary called Burned, Protecting the Protectors. I'm going to have a link down in the description. And with that, Dr. Graham Peasley. I hope that's okay. Very good. Um, that's fine. It's uh, this this particular podcast will probably come out in about. I, I break them up into two episodes, so this yeah. one will probably come out uh, in two Mondays, in two weeks, Very good. and then the next one after that. Um, and I'll let you know before they come out. If you want to see or hear this prior to me uh, putting it up, just let me know and I'll send it to you. No, um, it's but, not necessary. I think it'll be fine. Uh, uh, you'll do some editing. So when I say or an ah too often that you can clean me up a little bit if I say something, if I go off track. Do. Oh, yeah. I'll sit there. I'll say something just ridiculous. Like, Son of a gun. But, um, <laughs> we'll yeah, take I, that out. Yeah. Yeah. All the editing I do is for me. I mean, I screw up constantly. Uh, so uh, I've gotten really good at editing. But I've been looking uh, forward to you being on here. I got. I can't sure. lie. I mean, it, it's it's been really exciting i've actually told my uh, union president and vice president i've told mm -hmm. uh was it my uh one of my bosses and i said if you have any questions you know that we we need to ask as a group now you know let me know so let i've me got know. a few, yeah, few go. questions locked and loaded so well, there you go you, you have my email address too in case i can't answer them right now i'll think about it but i'll, I'll get back to you That's oh, i appreciate that so it, it the P uh, see, I'm editing that. I'm going to edit that right there. I'll probably leave it in so people know I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> PFOS is so big right now. And yep. um, everybody's talking about it. I'm a training officer, so I get a, a lot of questions about it. And I'm hoping you can help us all tonight uh, explain a few things. Now, if I understand correctly, you didn't get started. You didn't get started helping us, uh, the firefighters, until about four years ago, right? That's about right. Uh, maybe... Pre-pandemic, but about 2018, I'd say. Okay. Uh, Diane Cotta contacted me around the end of 2017, early 18, 2018. And that leading right into the uh, documentary short film, uh, Burned, Protect the Protectors. And so I got, my wife's making me say this part, by the way. <clears throat> she got, <laughs> she sent me an article about Burned, Protect the Protectors, way yep. before it lodged in my head and I actually watched it. So I come home like a typical husband. And I said, Oh my God, I saw this, this uh, documentary, Dr. Graham Peasley and, and it caught her. And she, she's just looking at me the whole time. I'm like, why are you looking at me like this? She goes, I sent you that article like weeks ago. So when she, when she uh, realized that tonight is the thing she did tell me, she's like, okay, you got to let him know that I try to give you that information earlier than you found it on your own. You think, but whatever, but, uh, it's been so big now, and it and, and rightfully so. And you've been thrust into the world of the firefighter now. Before uh, you started with this uh, helping us, did you have any uh, firefighter friends or be any reason to be in the fire service area around that what we do? Not in terms of academia. I have a distant cousin who was a fire chief uh, back in. Uh, ooh, he was probably in the eighties or nineties. I met him. He was a, he's like a fifth cousin or sixth cousin, and I was doing some genealogy, and he was in genealogy, and I ran into him. He was in Hingham, Mass., and he was a fire chief, and uh, so he, he talked to me all about the fire services then. I didn't know much about it, and uh, it was very interesting, but that's the only personal connection I have outside of what we've done since, and now my, I have a, you know, a million Facebook friends that are firefighters, and if I, have a, if I ever met them, I'd probably be friends with most of them, but uh, they're reasonable, reasonable people. Uh, but it's just a um, whole different world, whole different set of priorities. And uh, exactly. I understand uh, as soon as I saw this, I said, uh oh, we got to do something about it. And uh, that's what I've been doing since. And, you know, it's it's been uh, 
uh, remarkable how quickly things have changed. And so that's, I think, the the, the take home message is that, oh, my God, it's what, we're all going to die. But secondly, not soon, hopefully. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> the, the idea is that we can do something about it. And the fire services have moved very quickly. And I think that's a, it's a testament to the people who understood why they needed to and did. And, you know, the companies are trying to catch up a little bit, but they're, they're getting there. And they, they are also capable of moving quickly when, when asked to. And I think that's the, that's the best thing that's come out of this. So um, go ahead with the questions and we'll start there. And I can talk forever. So let me know. No, no, good, good. The less talking I have to do, the better. People, trust me, are not tuning in to hear me. They're tuning in to hear you. But let's, let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with PFOS, okay? Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to say the name. I'll let you do that. But can yep. you tell me about PFOS uh, and where it, where it is in, in all over and then kind of bring it down to where it is for us as firefighters? Absolutely. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is start with the name uh, and we're going to call it PFAS, not PFOS. Oh, and that's not, that's, that's not my funny, that's not my funny accent. That's just the idea that we're <laughs> going to talk about more than one, one of them. There are 12,000 of these blessed things and they are different structurally. They all have numbers and, and uh, identities. I only know about 200. So I'm, 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 I'm light, but there's about 12,000 that have been identified. And we call the whole category, the whole class of family of chemicals called PFAS, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, PFAS. And now there is a specific one, just one of those 12,000 is called PFOS, which is what mm -hmm. you were saying, PFOS. And that's the one that strikes the fire surfaces the most because it's in our AFFF. It's in the class B foams. And that's uh, now being phased out in most states, uh, if not all. And uh, those uh, those are the primary exposure routes we thought firefighters had before I got this uh, study done with textiles. And so that's a very specific one, PFOS. It's a nasty one. It's shown to cause several types of cancer and all sorts of other diseases. But it also is uh, pr primarily uh, very bioaccumulative. So it builds up in bodies. So if you eat food that have been watered with uh, this PFOS in it, it will it's, it's go into the plants. You'll eat the plants and you'll absorb it from the plants or the fish or whatever you eat that have also been exposed to it. So it bioaccumulates and it's persistent. Um, and that means it lasts forever. So these chemicals as a class have persistence, bioaccumulation, and toxicity, which is sort of the triple whammy of bad. Um, they mm. last forever once you make them. They're called the forever chemicals. Uh, forever means hundreds, if not thousands of years in the environment. Uh, these PFOS, PFOA, and then the whole category of PFAS are generally in that in that category. Several of them are plastics, and you know how long plastics last. They'll last out of uh, anything you throw in the trash. The plastic will still be there. Okay. And so those are thought to be less dangerous, uh, except that they always are made with all the PFAS, the short chain stuff that we can absorb readily or drink in our drinking water, are always there made with them. And so these polymers that were put into textiles turned out to be, oh, they're safe, they're long chain molecules. Well, yes and no. If you ate a roll of Teflon tape, it would pass through you, no great ill effects, except that all the material that helped make it is still along this on uh, attached to these these foils and, and other types of materials these textiles and the textiles were made not of pure fluoromer uh, fluoropolymer they're they're made of uh, a mixture and that means they degrade and they do shed uh short chain pfas off them ones we can measure mm -hmm. and so we're getting into a lot of detail so or right away but the idea is that these chemicals are all man-made they're all discovered in World War II or shortly before, and they were used uh, widely ever since the 1960s when uh, 3M and DuPont, who manufactured them first, discovered that these could be put into all sorts of products. And they went around and tried them. And the very first one that, that, that scored a hit was firefighting foam. And that was the, due to the Navy's need to aircraft carriers caught on fire. A 1967 mm -hmm. incident in the Gulf of Tonkin. Well, it was off the Vietnam War. It was not the Gulf of Tonkin, sorry. It was the Vietnam War. It was uh, John McCain's ship that caught fire with a, uh, somebody dropped live ordnance on the deck. And it caught fire and the fire crews responded. But before they could successfully put it out, it spread and it hit seven other thousand pound bombs and it took out 124 sailors, including the entire fire crew. It's a disaster. Um, the ship didn't sink, but it burned for three days till they get enough replacement crews on there to put it out. And it was uh, it was a big embarrassment, a billion dollar damage to the aircraft carrier, not alone, let alone the seven or eight planes they lost. Um, and so that was the um, same month uh, that the, the uh, 
3M had just developed this new thing called a firefighting foam, and they thought this would be better, and they responded to the call, and by the end of the year, within three months, the Navy had then articulated that everybody should be using AFFF and the uh, certified 3% uh, or 6%, so that would actually put out a fire in a short amount of time. And that was the standard for the, until 2019, 2020. Um, and the Navy kept on buying it, the Air Force kept on buying it, and they used it every day around the world for that many years. And suddenly we noticed that everybody's blood had this material in it, the PFOS in particular, but also mm. all the PFAS. And so everybody in North America has about five parts per billion in their blood. Oops. Everybody? Okay. Everybody. Not just firefighters, everybody. So this is, the, this is the tricky part. Where did that come from? They don't all use AFFF, right? Uh, the million firefighters do. What, what is the rest of the 300 million people in the U.S. getting it from? Well, they're drinking the water in which the, the AFFF and other products have been washed off into. And so a big study back in the 2000s was they looked at polar bear blood. Polar bears don't use firefighting foam, mm. yet uh, they have the highest amount in their blood. They have eight, the polar bear was discovered to have 88 parts per billion of PFAS in its blood. And, the, you know, North Americans, the top predator of the mid latitude has only got about five. So where are the polar bears getting from it? It's a, it's a long-lived chemical. It, it has a global circulation pattern. So over 30, 40 years, it goes towards the poles. That's where the winds blow it and the currents blow it effectively. And so it piles up in the ocean, the oceans where the aircraft's carriers have dumped all the foam for years. They just washed it off the deck because they were told it was safe as soap. You may have heard that before. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it went, into the, it went into the ocean. It's sucked up by the little critters that are eaten by fish, which are eaten by larger fish, which are eaten by seals, which are eaten by polar bears, and that's called bioaccumulation. So we often look at the North and South Pole to see the sentinels as to what sort of persistent chemicals is polluting our planet. And these things showed up uh, bright as it can be in the 1990s and 2000s when people started looking. And then they said, where are they all coming from? And uh, we also noticed at that time that it's in everybody's blood, all North Americans. So they started looking through blood banks they could find without it. And all the blood banks had it in every single blood we have. So the last sample we found without PFAS in it was a Korean War blood bank sample. That's how old it is. Golly. Uh, and so it has spread around the world, and it's not just firefighting foam, but every other use we have for it. It's used on ski waxes. It's used on mist suppression systems in machine shops. It's used as a scotch guard on our carpets. It's used in textiles. It's used in cosmetics. I mean, it's used everywhere. And so this was a company trying to get it used widely. They succeeded. It's a lot of industries. Over 200 industries use this chemical. Um, the firefighters were just one that used the most of it in terms of the firefighting foam. And often it was the military firefighters first. They, they had this... Um, the, the As you know, the military firefighters train more or less once a day if they're on an aircraft carrier. And uh, even on the uh, bases, there's 2,300 bases in the United States, I found out, either active or racked or um, uh, on reserve bases and um, joint, joint bases between reserves and active forces. So 2,300 of these things all had PFAS on the side, and most of them trained with it. So where did all that PFAS end up? Well, it ends up getting washed into the, into the groundwater, which then circulates into our irrigation water, circulates into our drinking water, and we all end up with it. Um, surprise. Uh, and it's a little present that we got from these man-made chemicals, and that's why you want to be really careful with forever chemicals, these things that last. Um, the other chemicals that would get out there, like lead, doesn't travel far. Or well, ones like rocket fuel that did travel far, they break down with time. And so in a, a couple of years, it sort of uh, microbes eat it and it goes away. Nothing is eating this stuff, and it lasts, and, and it gets everywhere. It's soluble. It gets in the water. So in many respects, this is the largest environmental poisoning that the U.S. has ever faced, and it's much larger than the fire services. It's uh, We're going to have studies come out this July and again for the next two years that show, as the EPA is doing these studies, that some fraction of the country is already drinking this in their water at very high levels or levels that shouldn't be there. And that fraction is not going to be the what we thought a couple of years ago of 3%. It's going to be more like 20 or 30% or maybe 40% of the country is drinking this stuff. And that's very dangerous. I mean, that's just, you know, we know that this has health effects, adverse health effects. We know that if you have it in your blood, you are more likely to have immune deficiencies. You're more likely to have certain types of cancer and certain types of endocrine disruption, uh, all that sort of bad stuff. And so we want to you know, as a, as a nation, we want to get away from this. And we are finally realizing that um, the, this is one that 
the first rule the EPA has ever proposed in 23 years, new rule in water, has been the PFAS one. They did a revision 12 years ago on the lead levels, but they haven't done a new rule in 23 years. And so this is the seriousness with which they're taking it. They're actually going to regulate it, which they've almost never done. They never regulated PFO and PFOS when it was a chemical um, because that was just voluntarily removed by the company uh, rather than trying to take them to court or anything like that. They just you know voluntarily removed it because they had 12,000 others to switch to. So it wasn't a big deal for the company. But for for the for the for those of us that live in the environment, which includes all the firefighters, we're getting it from our drinking water. We're getting it from our textiles, from our carpets at home. Oh, and yeah, by the way, <laughs> you guys work with foam. So that's what people were worried about. So several people have gone on and done firefighter studies of, of blood levels of PFAS in firefighters. Their blood levels are elevated over five, which was what we have normally. But mm-hmm. there is it, it's more like 10. Uh, average firefighters have a bit more. And that includes some military ones, some civilian ones, people that they got in this survey and that survey, but no comprehensive study being done. It's sort of, and it was a very expensive test up until a few months ago. It was $800 a test. So there weren't a lot of people doing the test. Uh, there's a group done in Australia that did a, a test of 700 of them, 700 South Australian firefighters. And their average was about 12. And the average population, that was about five. So it was a little higher than average. But how how bad is that? Well, it makes your immune system about half as good as those people at average, um, which could be significant, especially if you're exposed to toxic fumes and uh, other hazards, uh, which firefighters often are. And so does that make any opportunistic disease more likely? Yep. Um, and that means, could it explain all the cancers the firefighters, fire services are seeing? I hope not, but it could. It could contribute to it. And that's the, that's the fear. Um, and so uh, country has done pretty much an about face. We are now going away from uh, fluorine based. Uh, we've gone to fluorine free foams, FFF, as opposed to the AFFF. And those class B foams are hopefully fading. Uh, there's a bunch of them sitting on a shelf waiting to be used, which in several states are buying them back so that they don't accidentally get used. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know it's a it's a hazmat incident in some states to use the foam anymore. Uh, you have to fill out the forms because, uh, you know, uh, it, the li- loss of life and limb is really the balance to what you're going to have when this stuff. You know, take a single can, a single five-gallon gal- uh, container of AFFF. Um, that will poison, in the old days, 400 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Um, in the new days that they've lowered that by another thousand, that's, uh, 400,000 swimming pools you'd poison. (laughs) With one five gallon bucket? Yep. And you guys are sloshing that stuff around, right? Yeah. Well, so if let's, let's use that one example, use of a a carpet with, with the the coating on there. How how are we getting that into our bodies at home? If we're not a firefighter, but just anybody, uh, is it just absorb, is it absorption? Is it inhalation? I mean, what are we? All, it, all, of the, all, of, all of the above, there'll be some inhalation for those that are volatile, those that those those things that get in the air. PFAS aren't terribly volatile. There are some which are, but most of them are not. So we don't think that's a major source for most people. If you were in a fire in and didn't have uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, then yes, you could get it in the fumes because this thing would volatilize, but you'd have a lot worse things to you. They get all the dioxins and then, you know, the, the killers that are in the smoke. Um, and so we think that the self-contained breathing apparatus should prevent most of that. So then there's a question of dermal absorption. Can it go through the skin? Oh yeah, it can. Uh, it will do it less often than, uh, many things. Hopefully the skin is a pretty good protector in most cases, Mm -hmm. but, um, we don't know how much goes through. We know we have a couple of papers now published where N equal one individual tested it on himself and yeah, it went through the skin about 1% in six hours or 12 hours, I think it was. And so that means if you were exposed, uh, about 1% of what was on your skin would get into your blood. That could be significant if you had, if you took a bath in AFFF by accident, you know, mm-hmm. a, a canister broke on you or you covered with foam one time. If that got on your skin and you didn't wash it off in an appropriate amount of time, could that get through? Presumably. But there's also accidental ingestion and inhalation, uh, uh, in basically accidental ingestion. This is where, I don't know if you ever saw it, but the uh, San Francisco Fire Department did this wonderful commercial about how to decon after a fire. And they covered some poor rookie with, with shaving cream. 
And then she went around and didn't decon. And they watched where the shaving cream went as she took off the gear and sat down and had dinner or was eating a plate of food. And you see a lump of foam off the edge. And, and it was just a dramatization because uh, the, the foam was not toxic with shaving cream, right? right? And But when she touched her hair once, it got on the hair, it got on the plate of the food. And so it was very easy to see contamination spread. So if you don't do proper decon, well, imagine that you have to decon now for these AFFF as well. And you don't see those. You don't smell them. They don't, they don't smell like anything. They don't look like anything. They're just invisible particles that are there from contact from carpet, from contact with textiles, from contact of cosmetics, from contact. I know you guys wear a lot of cosmetics. But, <laughs> you know, uh, more importantly, it's on the food we eat. The the fish have high levels of it now. The the, the the Some vegetables grab it out of the soil, but also from the water we drink particularly. And, you know, it's a forever chemical. It's not really filtered out by anything. So here's, here's one that'll hit home. It's in the beer you drink, too, because nobody filters oh. the water before they drink it. There you go. Oh, damn it. Damn, I'm not invited to many of these podcasts anymore after I say that. You, know, you just go away peacefully now. I mean, I'm it's, in it's, that it, shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you just don't want to scare everybody. But, I mean, it's it's unfortunately can get everywhere. If they're using distilled water, yeah, you're safe. But most beers don't. Uh, most, uh, most soda does not, right? They use just the water out of the tap and carbonate it. Um, so if it's in the tap water, all of us, our kids and especially, are getting it. And so, you know, you don't want to you don't want to sound too doomsaying and things like that. But there's a toxic chemical that's out there. It's widespread. The first thing we can do is cut off the source. We've got to stop using the A triple We've got to recall it. Not not just we had one poor station that you know set a bunch of pallets on fire and they used up the rest of the foam. It's all gone. Magic. And like, oh uh, no, because oh, now it's uh, it's all in the field that they put it in. And so we don't want to do that. We don't want to clean the barbecue with AFFF anymore. Bad news. Um, all the sorts of stories we hear that people had actually used it. It, it shines the chrome up nicely on the engine, but you don't <laughs> want to use AFFF on that. Um, and we just want to go to the replacement foams. The replacement foams are fluorine free. They won't have this issue. Do they work as well? Some people say yes. Some people say, oh, it'll never work as well. And it depends. If you're in a jet A fuel fire, sure, I would be willing to bet there's some differences. But, you know, Heathrow's used this stuff for three or four years now without, and they're happy with it. Um, so I think that there is a satisfactory um, substitution in most cases. Uh, you know, the, the Navy has yet to remove the aircraft carrier one because they still are worried about those fires. But the, all the other Navy bases are now getting rid of the, the, the AFFF. And that was, a, that was the story as of five years ago. And, you know, it was terrible exposure, but now we're not going to stop using it. And as soon as all the fire departments figure out what to do with the old stuff, dispose of it as toxic waste and who's going to pay for that. Well, the legislation should pick it up and, and pay for it these days. And some of the states are, some of them aren't. Um, and then uh, everybody wanted to do studies on firefighters. And so several studies were done. They have slightly elevated uh, PFAS levels, but not, not, you know, not, you know, not so significantly. Though there's a range, right? Um, and I, I got to tell this anecdote because I tell it every time. The South Australian studies did this and they found one poor firefighter who had instead of five or instead of 12 as the average, he had 1,600. 1600. And think about what the, yeah. So we, uh, and he was more than double the next highest. The next highest was 700, right? So there, there's a range of people with hundreds and 200 and five, 700. There's one guy at 700, one guy at 1,600. And so the author of the paper went out to visit him and said, <laughs> I want to interview you and I want to know, uh, are you drinking the, the AFFF? <laughs> he says, no, nah, I haven't even used it, man. Uh, that We don't train with it. It was a suburban. He was a professional firefighter. He was a suburban. And in that part of Australia, they had um, uh, you had to be on uh, the station for a week at a time. Then they took a week or two off, and then they come back for a week because it was a, um, they lived two hours away. So mm -hmm. you know, it was a, it's a big suburban area. And in Australia, the distances are large. So you have, a, you have all the fire services 24 hours on, on, on shift. And then they respond quickly to the fire, and then they, they swap off. And as they were discovering many years ago that the firefighters, if they lived away from home for a week, they tended to eat Im improperly. Um, yeah. And the, their BMI was going up and all sorts of bad things. So they did two things. All the fire stations there put in a world-class gym and they put in a, uh, a top-grade um, uh, kitchen. And they taught them all how to cook organic. Good stuff. And so they ate better and they exercised. And guess what? They got the BMI under control and firefighters are generally happier. They had good food. Um, they still have pizza, but it's not 
all the time. Uh, and and so this was a, a big improvement in the lives of firefighters. And the guy they went to interview was in one of these stations. He had been in the services for several years, but not for long. Uh, he was in the, he's a bodybuilder. He was trying to build up his body because he had his athletic equipment and he was eating all organic and he was eating a high protein diet. So he ate five chicken eggs a day or chicken egg yolks a day. He put them in a drink and drank it up. And they were organic chicken eggs because they were grown at the station. The chickens were laying eggs at the station mm-hmm. and they were eating the wheat that they raised for their own bread makers in the station. And that wheat was grown right about where the old test fire training pit was. Oh. So the PFAS got into the soil. It got sucked up by the, the wheat. The wheat was given to the, uh, the chickens. The chickens ate it. It goes preferentially the egg yolk. And he was eating five egg yolks a day and had been doing that for a few months just to build up his, he'd gotten his, his protein mass up. And he was, you know, happily had no, no ill effects yet. Um, but with that much in his blood, they, they suggested he go and try to get some medicine and, and see what they could do. They put him on some statins or something to try and re- reduce his level of, of basically bleed him out of, of some of the, of some of the, uh, high, high levels he had in his blood. But that was, is that due to firefighting foam? Well, indirectly, yes. But it was sort of an exposure that nobody expected because, um, and you know, I've got to tell the second half of the story, which the Australians tell much better than I do. But they said <laughs> that, you know, what did the fire services do when they found this out? They sent a memo to all stations. Chickens will no longer be allowed to be kept on the station. <laughs> <laughs> that's Only in Australia. Sure. Yeah, oh, no, that's, yeah. that's, that's a fire service thing. That is exactly how, dude. That's hilarious. That, that, and I, I thought that was pretty good. But you know, that's the story of telling it how insidious these chemicals are. They can go through a route to get to you. You never thought of. It might be coming from other things. It might be coming from from the foam. If you if you have trained with foam and you have used it and you know it, the suds get everywhere. I mean, there are examples of them using them as slip and slides for the kids when they had the family day, right? I mean, people. People put the foam on everything and your exposure will go up. The, when these chemicals get in your blood, the half-life for the chemical is about five years. The PFOS in particular is five and a half years. So that means if you get a dose one time and you got it in your blood and it went up to 10, it'll take you five and a half years till it comes back down to five just because of how often you change your blood. It doesn't change that quickly and there's a lot of it in you. So that's really remarkable for a chemical. If you, and it's not true in mice. If you put it in a mouse, it all comes out in three weeks, which is relatively short. So guess what? Human blood is a little different, and uh, this chemical is really attached to human blood for some reason. So um, fast forward now, and I get sent a, a nice letter from Diane Carter, who said, uh, my husband's sick, and we think it might be his gear. Would you, can you, do you know if PFAS is in there? And I said, I don't know, I, but I'd be happy to test it. So she sent me some pieces. And uh, I called her back and said, okay, <laughs> these are really high in fluorine. So that suggests there's a lot of PFAS in them. I said, is this just your husband's gear or <laughs> does somebody not like him? Or is this everybody's <laughs> gear? And uh, and uh, it was a, actually the gear from a mannequin they had kept in the station. Um, and it was never used. And she said it was 10 years old. It wasn't sure that it was ever going to be, uh, ever going to have uh, fl- any fluorine left in it. And there was percent levels of it in there. There's, there's a ton of it. So then we did a study with about 40, 40, 50 sets of gear that people had sent us or swatches. And we were able to identify, yes, it was in all the gear because it's an FPA 1971 compliant. They're all made the same way. Right. The reflective stripes are a little different, but everything about the structural material is the same. It's put in there to make it waterproof, not to make it fire resistant. It's a, it's a waterproofing agent. It's a very good waterproofing agent. It keeps you very dry. Uh, so you keep the water on the outside and the, it beads off the, the suit, which is the idea. Um, unfortunately, the way they put it on, they put it on the outside shell, but they also put a moisture barrier on the inside layer. Then, so you had two parts of the of the, con, of the <clears throat> gear, and you often had a thermal liner in between, mm-hmm. and that was never treated, or not <clears throat> for most of them. That was never treated, so that was free of fluorine, except for where it rubbed off the other two parts. That rubbed off the outside, or it rubbed off the moisture barrier. And so we saw the older the gear, the more PFAS got into the, that thermal liner that had none. Right. Um, and we're like, so it's passing from layer to layer. And then we did a test. Um, unintentional, my students actually noticed that they had garment to hand transfer. And once the student did this, he wore a pair of gloves, which had no fluorine on it. Then he handled the gear for a few minutes. Then he took the glove off and, and put it in the measurement device. And we saw, we saw fluorine. So part per million levels of fluorine transfer the glove in a few minutes. And we're like, okay, nobody's allowed to handle this stuff in the lab anymore unless they have gloves on. And 
that image, when we had the students holding the gear up with their gloves on, the purple nitrile gloves, uh, they were no longer wearing it for fun. They, they thought it was pretty cool to have a fire suit in the house and they wanted to wear <laughs> it for Halloween and like, no, it's a sample. You can't wear it. Um, but more <laughs> importantly, they discovered it has PFAS. They suited up and they were like, they're touching it with gloves. They don't want to touch this because they know that the PFAS is a, is a toxic chemical. And the so, fire services had not known this at the time we did this. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just astounded. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be heated up. It doesn't have to off gas. It's just, it just by touching anything with PFOS will it can get it in your, in your body. Uh, anything is a, is a wide word. If you had firefighting foam, yeah, and you, you slather that on, that, will get, that could go through the skin. That could be inhaled accidentally. There are several examples where the, the accidental discharge in the cab or something like that, people inhaled it or swallowed it. Um, you, you're wiping it all over your body. You can get foam exposure or ingestion or inhalation. Um, this is a – when we touch the gear, we got dust off it. So basically, if you rub any – fabric together for a while, you'll start getting dust, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's a fire service gear, it'll have a little black dust for the black suits and the, the tan dust for the tan suits. But you'll get some dust off it. That dust was loaded with uh, PFAS. In fact, we did a dust study in a, a second paper. We did a dust study in a, a 15 different fire stations in Massachusetts. And the the fire station dust that had the most PFAS in it was the one in the gear with, that can held the gear container, not the, not the AFFF container that was out in the station bay. Really? There's eight buff cans out there. There was not much because that's sealed in a can. And generally, unless somebody's slopping it around, there's not a lot of it in the dust. Whereas the dust in the fire station under the gear container or in the living quarters were where the highest fluorine concentrations were. And so that armed together with our study that said, hey, there's not only PFAS in here, we identified which type it was. We said there's a lot of it and it comes off. We had this garment to hand transfer and we, we know it's in the dust and we followed up with a dust study saying, hey, we measure the dust, it's there. So that means that, um, you know, I went to the local fire department. I gave, uh, they had a, a nice um, routine there. They have a meeting once a month uh, it's called Tactics on Tap. They talk mm -hmm. about things that they can talk about to improve their, their fire services, and they do it over beer. And so, <clears throat> free beer, I'll go, sure. <laughs> I, I went and I, I told them about PFAS and the gear, and one of the guys raised his hand in the back and said, well, we are, they had already done a thing where if it isn't an actual active fire call, they respond as a paramedic as well. So they go out to the scene and they don't wear their gear unless it's uh, something that looks like it's going to turn into a fire. And then they, then they don it there, which is a, it's a really different, difficult policy decision, right? The fire services treat that differently in metropolitan areas versus less metropolitan areas. But mm -hmm. the, um, <clears throat> If it isn't called in as a fire, it's just called in as an accident or called, called in as a, a, a paramedic call, then they went with the gear in the truck. And then they, because in a you know, hot day, you can respond quicker and all that sort of stuff. But they, um, <clears throat> the guy was asking that we've never cleaned out the truck. There's a little container in the truck where they held all the gear. <clears throat> It says there's about an inch of dust in the bottom of that container. It said, should we be cleaning that out? And, you know, I never knew that, A, the, the container existed, or that was the policy in this particular station. But I uh, I said, well, yeah, you, you should not be inhaling that dust. And although you're not eating it deliberately, some of it always transfers and gets around. And if you, uh, you know, um, just like they talk about decon these days, when you're, when you're exposed to the toxic chemicals from the smoke, mm -hmm. if you don't decon before you get back in the cab and you drive, What's that off-gassing do? It's, it's now starting to, it's rubbing against the seats. Uh, and so then you can get the toxic chemicals transferred to the seat cushion and things like that. Same thing with this, this, this dust coming off the suit. If you're wearing your turnout gear and you take it back and you don't keep it completely separate all the time, it will transfer. So we have volunteer firefighters here that put the, the turnout gear in the trunk of their car because they are sometimes municipal, sometimes volunteer. They'll take their gear with them. And then, um, you know, it's mixed in with the kids' laundry um, instead of having extractors in the, in the station. Right. Um, all <laughs> that isn't good. Um, and the yeah. extruded water, yes, will have PFAS in it. Um, so is that broadening the PFAS exposure? Yeah. And so all these things that people don't think about, and I didn't know about since the, I didn't know where people are using this and so i'm learning and i'm you know i imagine some poor rookie in south bend is now vacuuming out this this uh, truck <laughs> once a week uh, <laughs> oops sorry dude uh, but you have a hepa filter vacuum and you suck it up it'll be safer and, and that's true but the really the safe thing to do is get rid of this as a chemical on your gear and so that was my argument in the paper we wrote a paper <clears throat> and we uh, caught the attention of AIFF uh, because they um, had a change of leadership right then. And Ed Kelly came along and he said, uh, he, he actually asked, 
who's the best PFAS expert in the country? And so I told him, I said, I'm going to ask her to do a study. I said, go for it. She'll do a good study. And he did. He got the top person in the country who knows PFAS to do the same study I did, except she got funding for it. Uh, <laughs> and, she did, and she did a much better job. She's, a, she's an expert at PFAS. Uh, her name is Jennifer Field. And she's at Oregon State. And she did a marvelous job with this. And she actually looked to things I couldn't look for. She looked for the volatiles, which I don't have the equipment for. Mm -hmm. I was looking just for the presence and absence. And I identified some of it, but I couldn't identify all of it. I didn't have enough money to do all, all the things. And the good news is she reproduced the results we did, which is, <clears throat> means I wasn't wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's what <laughs> that you was a good want, thing. right? Yeah, well, well, I, I wish I was. I really do. But um, in this case, it wasn't wrong. And in fact, it was worse. There's more volatiles than people think, especially on that moisture barrier. That moisture barrier has a lot of off-gassing. <clears throat> And that's without a fire. Uh, <clears throat> luckily, you guys don't go anywhere near fire, right? So it doesn't it never gets warm, right? Right, um, right. So that's that's even more concerning than with our first paper. So yes, those papers are out there. We now know it's peer reviewed. We've got lots of people that can reproduce it. Um, and the IAFF did a really remarkable job of about 180 degree bout face. Uh, Ed Kelly apologized that I encountered in person and said, we were wrong to ignore you. Uh, this is serious and we got to do something. And he's led the charge ever since. And I think that's remarkable and a union can change like that mm -hmm. uh, because it was just a matter of putting some material in front of them and saying, look, and the companies that make the gear, there's not a chemist among them, right? They all just sew the gear together. They buy the textiles and sew it together. And then there's a company that makes the textiles, but they don't use the chemicals. They just buy the chemicals and add it to their textiles. So the, the manufacturer is three chains back. Nobody knew. And so when they said that we don't use PFAS in the gear, they were sincere in many cases. Uh, they didn't know. And then they said, no, you're using it. And they said, well, it doesn't come off. And I said, no, it does, it does come off. Well, how do you know? Well, watch this and we do that. Okay. Yeah, it comes off. Well, we use the safe kind. Well, there is no safe kind. So all these things are being said by people that don't know what a PFAS, what PFAS are. And so I, I go through all these arguments and then suddenly, well, what does that mean? It means that we've got something that isn't good for the first responder on their gear. Um, and the answer to that is change the gear. Um, and it's it's not going to be sudden. It's not going to drive any of these companies out of business. They're going to sell more gear, right? They're going to be in great right. shape. But they're going to sell the, without these chemicals. And, and then there's a backlog. Honestly, the companies can't respond quick enough. Uh, one of the companies, one of the textile manufacturers read the social media tea leaves about, I told everybody I was doing this study. I did a year in advance. I went and visited all the went to gear makers, and, or at least their representative. And I said, look, this is what we're seeing. Could it be? And they said, well, we use the safe stuff. No, no, this is the stuff you're using and it's not safe. And so it was a, you know, I, I did all these things and most of the manufacturers, you know, sort of said, well, hopefully it goes away. Um, one of them actually said, what's our plan B? And they came up with this material, which is now available, which is the outer shell, which is P, uh, PFAS free. And another company has recently come up this year, came up with a, com a moisture barrier that's PFAS free. And oh, I've, wow. I haven't tested that one yet, but that's a huge advance over what we what we have. And in that already short started, of time, they developed that in that short of time. They said they've been working on it for years. <clears throat> My paper just happened to beat them before they got the they got to the in, in Atlanta, and they didn't really have the motivation because even if they came up with a new one, why would people switch from the old one? Because this company's already got a huge market. Mm -hmm. um, so what they did is they they had done some research on how to to replace it. But it wasn't uh, going to replace everything. and There was no need for it. But when the paper hit and then suddenly IFF recognized and they did their own paper and said, oh, this is bad, um, then then there was a real need to do this. And so we had to change uh, what, the, what, the, uh, uh, um, what the availability was of this material. Once it's available, you have a choice. Would you like the turnout gear with toxic chemicals or the turnout gear with less toxic chemicals? <laughs> and it's, it's a pretty obvious choice. And, and, you know, I don't have anything against the gear manufacturers. I think they were, you know, everybody should do due diligence that, you know, what you're making your stuff with. Uh, and if somebody comes and tells you, this is really good, but it contains asbestos, you might watch out. Um, <clears throat> if it's, if so, you, you watch for things that are really good. But of course, you'd like your gear to be the best. So for the first responder, we want the best. But um, <clears throat> there will be uh, some unscrupulous co companies that will make this chemical and say it's safe. Um, no, it isn't safe. And we shouldn't be using it in our foam, in our gear, or anywhere else. Um, and we're <clears throat> most of the companies have now quit. Uh, well, 3M certainly backed out of it this year. They just paid $10 billion for poisoning the country's water supply. Um, <clears throat> and they that's, you know, that's B with a billion. I mean, that's a lot of money. But they're still in business, and uh, they're hoping that that will stop the lawsuits for a while. Um, is that for the uh, the foam, the, the foam one? 
Because I see, I get that all the time through my social media. Like, if you've ever used yep. AFFF, but that's what that ten billion went to. It went to clean up the not the AFFF. It went to clean up the water supplies, uh, provide alternate water supplies, or cleaned up water supplies. Um, because where did that AFFF go? If you ever had an incident where you used it uh, before last year or two, uh, they you wash it off the street, and so it's not slippery. And then you, uh, it went into the ground or it went into the surface water and it went downstream and made a little bit of foam. But the foam was safe as soap, right? Well, mm -hmm. guess what? Yeah. It lasts for a thousand years. It isn't safe and it starts building up in critters that are in it. And we eat the critters or we uh, we eat the fish or we, we put on vegetables and we eat the vegetables. So it gets into us and we drink the water off and the water goes through a water treatment system, but it's not. it doesn't remove PFAS. We don't know how to remove it effectively. It, it, it can be removed by some filters, but it's expensive. So we're not doing that all water supplies yet and we don't have the money to do it to all water supplies. So we've got to find some clever ways to clean it up. And so this is the long-term prospect. And firefighters right in the middle of it, um, lucky you. Yeah. Um, and and the thing that, the only thing that was, was bad was that nobody told you guys. I mean, if you're told right now that your gear has this toxic chemical on it, but you are going to go to a fire tomorrow, you need to wear your gear. Absolutely. Right. Uh, it keeps you safe in a fire. And it does keep you safe. It's designed right. to do that. Um, but it can be designed exactly the same way, NFPA 1971 compliant, and now be PFAS free. That's a win for everybody. It works as well. You're safe in a fire. And when you take it home or you wash it with something else or you're wearing it all day, you're not getting a continual exposure to a chemical that we know causes cancer and other things. Um, there's a... Yeah, I got firefighters with ulcerative colitis, and guess what? That's one of the diseases it causes. It's an immune disease. Uh, there's uh, hypertension. Well, that can come from stress. It can come from a lot of things. Uh, but you guys aren't, luckily aren't in a stressful job, right? Um, yeah, right. And so, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, so you don't know where all these things come from. Can you say that PFAS causes this chemical? Did, did Paul Cotter's cancer come from this chemical? We don't know that. Uh, we know that he was exposed to this chemical through his gear. We know his, he um, he contracted cancer, as did many many other firefighters do too. He survived it. He caught it early. Good for him. Uh, but it was uh, it, a good note to all your all your listeners to get those checks as often as you can. I know you're young and invincible, but uh, some yeah. of us, and I'm including you in this, I don't know how old you are, but uh, oh, we're old enough. Oh, bless your heart that, for calling me young. I love that. Well, I just had a mole removed on that ear. You can see that. There's, oh, my, wow. there's my show and tell for the day. Yeah. You never know. When it's, it's Hopefully it's just a carcinoma and not, not the melanoma. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a mole. That's why I've not shaved today for you. Uh, otherwise, I'd shave Jake, I'd shave Jake but there you go. Uh, no, um, no. I want you to be nice and comfy for three-point firefighter. Why would you yeah, of course. Put yeah, on no. airs. No. Yeah. Let me but see anyway, so that's the story. I'm sorry. Yep. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. I, not at all. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going on. I sort of gave you the whole kit and caboodle at once, and I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to scare everybody, but I'm also trying to empower you to say, look, you can do something about it. We need to switch the gear. It's going to take ten years, so it's probably not going to affect uh, the in-service firefighter today. But by the next generation, they should be wearing PFAS for a year. And there'll still be lots of toxin out there. You're still fighting fires. You still have risk. Every time you put that suit on, you've got risk. But it's far. It's more important to think about that risk in the building than it is to think about, oh, my God, am I getting it from my gear that I'm wearing? And so that's one risk we can do something about. And it doesn't cost anybody their job. Uh, guess what? DuPont's going to make a little less money because they don't sell as much of this chemical. Oh, all darn the, all it. the all the uniform makers will stay in business. All the textile manufacturers will stay in business, but they're going to change, and that's going to cost them a little bit. Uh, oh well, um, you know, it's they're going to sell more gear at the end, and I think this is the this is the way the free market works, and so we push it that way. There'll be regulations, there'll be lawsuits someday, and things like that. I'm sure there's lawsuits now, but it's one of those things that it's the fear of litigation that drives these things. The companies are going to do it out of the goodness of their heart and for fear of litigation, <laughs> and, it'll, yeah. and it'll get done. And and I think that's the way America works. We could try to regulate it like the Europeans. Mm -hmm. It'll take us 12 years to pass a law, and then you'll then you'll have a day to get it done, and you, it'll take 10 years from there to change all the gear. So I think what we're doing now is is the best we can do. I'm really uh, happy that the firefighters uh, don't shoot the messenger. They they don't. They still invite me to talk sometimes, like you do. Uh, they never invite me back. I'll tell you that. But it's a it's um. But it's one of those things that um, people are listening. The fire services do have a good. Um, what we call a network and mm -hmm. I, I it's a social media network whatever it happens to be people talk to each other and people are talking about pfas and i went to iaff uh, no, the fdic last april and the first I thing i asked you about that yeah I walked into the building and there's a parking garage with a three foot banner and it said it was a advertisement for steadfast and it said 
fluorine-free membrane technology now available. It was their announcement three days before the meeting that they had invented a, a moisture a fluorine-free. So the first word I see in a firefighter conference is fluorine-free. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, they really are talking about this. And, and, and the company had done a, a really good job. They had gotten it done by FDIC so they could announce it. It has to be checked out by everybody, of course, but they did some testing and they said it was fluorine free and the tests they did were good. So I suspect that it is fluorine free. We'll test it ourselves in the next week or two and, and then we'll confirm it. But I mean, it's, it's one of those things that once that gets available, then you can replace both the inner and outer layer. And we're working with IAFF as to how do you tell, but it's fluorine free. And so, so it's not clearly labeled. It's just, you have the outer shell and the inner shell. Are they both fluorine free and, uh, or is it just one or both? And there'll be a few years of trying to tell it apart. But in the future, we'll have a, a gear that works just as well as just as useful and functional as it is now and safe. It has the reflective tape. That's where the real danger comes in, right? Uh, and, and so make sure that you, you have the gear as the same make they have now, but it'll be flooring free. And, and to that end, I'm proud of what I'm doing. I, I, you know, I've stepped on a few toes, I'm sure, but I haven't, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't sent anybody's, I haven't lost anybody j their job. And in fact, what we hope is it's going to be safer in 10 years. And uh, it's an opportunity to fire services to take control of what they can control. They, I mean, you can control the gear. You, you have regulations on what it is. You have regulations on what it shouldn't be. Um, right. And it can be done. I, it, the change of regulation will take years. But to, uh, to have gear that's fluorine free is already happening. And that's, uh, that's a testament to the people that listened and said, whoops, this is a problem. We're going to change it. Um, and I think, you know, once you know the risks, you can minimize them. And that's, that's the beautiful part of your job, right? You go in and you, you assess risks every day and you try to minimize them. So you had some questions. I should let you talk. No. Yes, actually. Thank you very much. So I want to, first, let me, let me do a little summary. So I, I want to make sure I understood this. Yep. Um, so because of the AFFF a million years ago, not a million years ago, but years ago, <laughs> It's, it's contaminated the water supply so bad that it's just gone into everything all around the world. It's in your water yep. and everything. So uh, the best we can do now is try to minimize that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm processing so much of what you said. Yeah. And it's, it's in our gear. It's in our outer, gear, outer shell and our, our moisture barrier. But at the same time, as that gear rubs together over a period of time, uh, it starts to transfer. It seems to be – you told the story about the dust. It's easily transferable. Yep. Um, a couple of questions here. What can we do? You mentioned that it's the next generation firefighter that's going to be able to enjoy PFAS free gear across yep. the board generally. So what do you what do can now? We do? What do we do now? You know, what do we yep. do now? Like um, I have, I, I, when you said that about your, your students, like touching the gear to do the test, of get, you know, getting on their hands. I'm like, man, I've had gear in my, all over my training office and we're tearing it apart, cleaning it and doing all this stuff. So what can we do now to minimize our exposure to PFAS? Yep. Uh, it's a great question. I get PFAS. asked that a lot. PFAS. Very good. Sorry. Oh, look at that. I learned, you you learned it. That's good. <laughs> high points, high points. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to say is uh, the policies have to come from the fire services. I can tell you how to run your life. Um, they're not going to listen to me, right. but I can make some suggestions. And the, the suggestions come about where do you keep the gear? When do you wear it? And how do you clean it? Um, so the first question is, if I get new gear, should I wash it? Absolutely. I mean, you should wash it according to instructions, according to manufacturer instructions. They're very specific. Mm -hmm. But washing it will remove loose loose uh, PFAS from it for a while. Then mm -hmm. you'll rub more off. But uh, that's the first step. Second step is when you don't have to wear it, you shouldn't wear it. And that, that conflicts with many station policies. I want to be at least half-dressed by the time the alarm goes off if I've got to be uh, on call in a, in a rapid area. Right. And every every station every chief is going to have a different policy on this but um are there cases where you respond well <clears throat> there are two types i mean if you're on a response you got to decide and that's a policy the fire services should make if, if it's a response and it could be a flame uh, uh, uh engulfed fire you want to be on the scene prepared not dressing there it looks unprofessional to be dressing when you get there um, right. i understand that i understand the response time issue um so but if you are out of service or not um, having to respond in seconds to a call, which is not often, but I understand that um, we shouldn't be wearing it in the living quarters unless you need to I keep it in a station area. Uh, decon it as frequently as you can, or uh, you know, it's pretty required nowadays in most municipal areas mm -hmm. to decon after a fire because you, you know those those uh, cancerous uh, uh, smoke particles and all the other things that come with them are there. Pretend it's there even before you started and then say, okay, we should wash this thing as often as we can um, without wearing it out. Uh, but 
they won't. But if you have an uh, uh, what is it extractors at work, mm-hmm. um, and and you haven't washed it in a while, even though you haven't been on a call, it wouldn't be a bad idea to wash it more often. The guys here came up with ideas about you know where do you store it? Should the bins in which they're stored, where there's a lot of uh, there's often drying racks where these things dry after you've mm-hmm. after you've put them through the extractor, those are often kept separate. They they dry over here and this air blowing through it. Well, is that same air that you're breathing like the diesel exhaust, <laughs> or do you have some place that does that elsewhere? That's an engineering solution. That may be a small thing. I have a guy who's a um, equipment specialist, a PPE specialist, out of the big county in, in California, and he does a lot of sewing and repairing, so the gear gets back in shape without buying a whole new set. And mm-hmm. he's he's in charge of outfitting 100, I think 1,500 firefighters, and so he has a lot of uh, things like that. And he said. What about me? I mean, I'm in here with a sewing machine and 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 hundreds of these things hanging up, and he he says, you know, he, he makes sure they're all clean before he gets to him, so that he doesn't get the off gassing. But he says, what about the dust in my office? So he asked for a HEPA filter in his office. He asked for a, a extra air source and a HEPA filter, and he um, uh, he got it. I mean, it charged him money, and uh, the chief didn't know anything about this, but he knew he was pretty damn insistent, and he liked the guy, so he gave him an office. He gave him an office away from the where the gear was kept in one place, and he he goes in the oh, yeah. and works with the gear, but he puts his office out. It used to be his office was right with the gear all around him. Now he has a, a closet somewhere else that is not free from the gear, and it has this one with the gear has a HEPA filter that's continuously filtering the air to get rid of the dust. Um, so that was a, a, an engineering solution. There are a couple of examples I'll also give, which are, um, I see you guys all the time. We have a stadium here. It's a Notre Dame stadium, actually. Mm-hmm. And the firefighters like running up and down it to show that they're tough. And boy, they're, t- <laughs> they're tougher than I am. I go up that step when I'm huffing and puffing. These guys are in full gear, often carrying a hose or something weird. And they're going up and down the steps to show how many times they can do it. And I, I went to you know, or they have, you have all the rookies trying to climb up a ladder or trying to do something hard and guess what they're wearing? All their gear. <laughs> yep. Cause it's heavy and you got to be able to do it in gear to be in shape. Uh, I think that's a great thing. It gets you in practice and shape and all sorts of good things. Um, I would suggest for the next five years, we sort of 10 years, we take a moratorium on the gear unless you, know, they can still huff and puff and, and, and test the cardiovascular and steps with carrying heavy loads, no less, um, uh, but they can they can do it without the gear on for a couple of years, and that would reduce that exposure. It's an unnecessary exposure. Is it going to lead to cancer? Well, statistically, yes, <laughs> but you've got dozens of people doing it. What's the chance that it, it led to an increased exposure for you? I don't know, uh, but I wouldn't want to, you know, those are things where you, uh, you go into a show and tell. You have the school kids coming by. Uh, yes, it's really good to look like a firefighter, uh, but you wear your, your, your uh, regular uniform, um, you still look pretty impressive. And so uh, for a few years, we're not going to uh, have the, the gear worn to the library when you're doing a show and tell or it's the elementary school. Right. Um, when you're training, of course, you got to have the gear on. When you're in, when you're actually in fire situation, you got to have the gear on. It keeps you safe. Well, that's uh, one of the questions I had that somebody yep. asked me uh, when we first started having this conversation uh, at my department. And as a training officer, they came up to me and they said, "We need to limit the time we train in our gear." And that got me thinking. I'm like, "Yeah, you know, we have to train, but do we have to do it?" At this particular time, we were doing live burns. That was like three hours. You were in your gear. Yep mostly you had some part of your gear on for three hours and yep. i'm like you know what i can see cutting that in half and spreading out more days um and then start me down a rabbit hole i'm like i wonder if there's a a, a, re- a recommendation out there but after talking to you i can see why i could really find one because right now the best practice is just minimize as best you can you know yep. don't keep it to your point don't keep them in gear to exercise but if you're doing legitimate training and it requires all your gear, do that. But uh, every opportunity we can to not have to wear it, I guess we, we really need to work on that for now, for and, us, for this current generation. And don't forget that there are, are volunteers and there are full municipal firefighters. There are military firefighters. They got rid of the silvers now, but they still wearing gear. Um, and then you have um, – all sorts of mixtures in between. You have wild end and you have also, and the wild end gear is different and it really doesn't have PFAS most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then you have municipalities that, you know, inner city Boston is going to be a lot different than suburban South Bend. It's going to be mm-hmm. a lot different than the fire, the, the oil wells of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got different situations that they practice for the wildfires of California. I mean, and they all need to train in different ways. 
And I think that one rule fits all is not going to happen, especially with, uh, but, you know, they had a rule that everybody has to start wearing SVBA as soon as it became available because they knew that was carcinogenic. Yeah. Um, and that was more or less national. And the rule will be here that we'll all have PFAS free gear eventually. In the meanwhile, you do the best you can. You stay safe. That's the most important thing. Um, so if you're in a fire exercise, even a, a, a live fire exercise or, or, a, um, or a real actual fire, you want your gear and you got to have it on and you've got to treat it seriously. Um, and, and you guys know all the reasons for that. Uh, so I'm not trying to upset any apple carts there. Just if we could um, keep separate from the gear, um, the volunteers shouldn't be taken at home. Of course, they have to because there's no place right. to leave it, et cetera, so forth. Um, what do we do the gear when we're done? Well, we often send it to fire academies <laughs> so they can train in gear <laughs> that they don't own yet. Yeah. Oops. Um, this is the old gear. It's probably shedding more. Uh, it right. has probably a lot of stuff on it. So welcome to Fire Academy, guy. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna douse you up with chemicals. Yeah, um, we'll start you off with your cancer <coughs> path early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. So I, I'm not gonna say don't do that. I mean, it's a, what else are you gonna do? You're gonna have to pay for more. It's gonna be more costly and things like that. But maybe those guys get some of the newer gear. Mm -hmm. um, that would be that would be humane. Uh, but there's a lot of you in service folks that have been waiting for lots of time and said, "Hey, I've been wearing this for ten years. It's time to get my." And that's honestly true too. So I mean, it's just it's a bunch of policies. Um, I don't want to say yes or no on any of them. I think anything that reduces your exposure would be the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there is dust, so minimizing dust exposure is just common uh, cleanliness. Um, the decon has become a, a really changed a lot in the last 10 years, right? So they have these little tents that people can decon right beside the site and things like that. Sure. Uh, but I, you know, this stuff is on the gear. So when you first put it on, you've got it on. Um, so how do we, how do we minimize that exposure? I don't know. Um, I, it doesn't the, have to be heated up. It doesn't have to be, I mean, it just has to, you just have to have any <laughs> gear on current gear and you risk an exposure to, to PFAS. Yep. And it, I hope it's not significant. That's Jake. That's my sincere hope. I hope that the, the, we can do a study in the future. People are trying it but to see how much comes from the gear and how much comes from the AFFF. And I hope that AFFF wins and the gear is only a minor component. Uh, but what if I'm wrong? What happens, what happens if it's, if it's more, I think the AFFF is a more serious source. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, God forbid that anybody's practice with this stuff and put it down the local drain, uh, which we've all done. Yes. Uh, but if that if that happens, um, where does that go in my community? And is that part of the problem that my water utility is having getting clean water supply? Oops. Um, that's that's we know there's a couple of places where that's happened already, and I'd hate that. You know, and that means that. You guys live in the community you serve, so you wouldn't poison your own water intentionally. You were just never told. Um, and so that's, I think, where the realization comes in. We do the best we can with the information given. Now we know something that we didn't know before. It's, it's, this, one is, uh, this one is addressable. We can change the gear. But, boy, that doesn't help you now. Uh, no, I look back are... on times when I was, at, like, for <clears throat> in any state of Indiana, you uh, have to do your hazmat awareness and ops uh, yep. to be a firefighter one and two. Well, that means you have to spray foam and practice the different ways to apply it. And I, yep. I'm talking to you, I'm listening about thinking about all the times that I've done this training and walking around in foam uh, and <clears throat> it's, it, it gets all over you anyway. And then just taking the, uh, the, you know, the, the tube out of the bucket to show people, you know, how the, the how set up the, yeah. yeah. And, and now you just got me thinking like, Oh my God, how many, so if we do, okay. Is there a regular blood test? Could, could you know, Jake yes. Barnes go to his doctor and say, do blood test him. This is in me. And if so, what do we do if it's high? Very good. Hi, I got some good news for you. There. Um, well, mostly good news. Um, the blood test used to have to be ordered by an MD, mm -hmm. and then you'd have to go to a phlebotomist. Luckily, you've got lots of them in your station, uh, and you grow all the blood. Then you have to send it off with a script to a lab that would do the analysis. It cost 800 bucks for the lab to do it. It took six mm -hmm. weeks. And then the results would come back, and somebody would have to read them to you because – it has results. What does that mean? <laughs> um, and so it was pretty useless. Uh, very few people got it done because 800 bucks wasn't covered by insurance for anybody. And so it was uh, only done when there was a known exposure. Um, and so fast forward to last year, uh, Eurofins USA came up with a uh, capillary test, not a venous draw. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pinprick and you put a drop of blood on a card and you send them the card. And then wait six weeks, you'll get the answer back. And their reports have gotten a lot better. It's actually quite legible. You have this much of this and this much of this. And this is what the limit of detection was, which means the limit of detection is one. 
we, uh, we, we you know, 50 parts per, uh, of per trillion, and you see one part per billion in your blood, or you see two parts or five parts or 12, and they have each of them individually listed. So you have to go through and count them all up to see what it adds up to. But mm -hmm. the sum of most, most people have four of one and four of PFAS and one of PFOA in their blood in North America, and then 0.1 and 0.2 of all the others. And so n that's a pretty un um, common measure metric. And mm -hmm. then you compare yours to that and you can say, gee, I'm not elevated or I'm elevated. Um, so that be has become $300 test. Uh, it's still not covered by insurance. Um, but if you can convince your township or your utility or your uh, employer that wouldn't it be best to screen for health effects if you knew what to look for? Mm -hmm. um, and so a very clever fire department chief in South Bend managed to get the city of South Bend to test uh, his, his, his uh, firefighters because he wanted to make sure they could do some sort of pre-screening for cancers and stuff like that because a stage one cancer is less costly to the city than a stage four cancer. And yeah. in reality, to his, his to his brothers, uh, he was he was thinking a uh, stage one is a hell of a lot better to deal with than stage four, oh, yeah. and uh, and so but he did he used the cost benefit when he went and asked for the money for it, and they gave him money because he said oh in the long term it'll save us money yeah we don't have to do that that's good, and then to the to his to the people he serves he's like we got this testing we got to do it, um, and that's not widely spread we have our first. Uh, uh, state legislator, also from South Bend, who's in Indiana, has got a thousand firefighters being tested a year now, which is better wow. than zero. Yeah, um, yeah. And she got, she got state funding to do a thousand tests. And what happens with the results now? We get the results back and we'll see whether they're elevated or not. We'll see some people higher than others. We'll ask what they do. We'll also say, gee, if you have a high level, what do you do about it? There's not a lot you can do. It's going to come out of your blood slowly, um, but as you lose red blood cells, and that's not a high turnover for a male. It's a little quicker for a female, uh, for obvious reasons, but it can also, uh, so that does come out of females quicker, uh, but they're also got different types of cancers and we're not looking for female cancers. Uh, the fire service is so male that we're typically looking at male cancers. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. So we need to be looking for indicators of cancer, uh, early. Um, that's, that's something you can do. The guy who was up at seven, 1600 or 1600 or whatever, 1600, I think it was his level. I mean, that was a special case. They did some medical intervention and they tried to basically remove his blood. They did some, they took some, um, donate blood and, and don't put it to the blood bank, but destroy it. I mean, that would, uh, reduce your uh, blood counts. And that's a pretty serious medical intervention. You take a, you know, you donate blood regularly anyway, but if you take your blood out and you know you have high PFAS, don't give it to the blood bank, uh, discard it and just generate new blood. And your PFAS levels will come down with successive generations of blood. But even, even uh, with that, you'd mentioned that all the blood pretty much has PFAS in it. So, but he's, he's going from 1600, hopefully down to five. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we, we would like to get him there. And I don't know the outcome of that story. It, it was a couple of years ago when I heard the story and it was a remarkable story, but it's, um, I'm sure they, I heard they intervened. They put him on some medicines as well, some blood thinners, and I think, uh, to try and reduce it. I don't know if that therapy worked, but somebody seemed to, seemed to think it would. Um, but those are, you know, more dangerous drugs. Uh, I, I'm, trying to avoid you know, it sounds like bloodletting we did that in the 1200s right but uh, maybe they were onto something <laughs> uh, they certainly were i mean if you are have a toxin in the blood uh getting your blood to resupply and a healthy adult can generate you know a couple of liters of blood a month or whatever it is i i think that would be you know you but you want to be careful because you're also going to get lightheaded after you donate a, a pint of blood uh so mm -hmm. you want to uh, you drink some orange juice and make sure you're not going straight to work on shift then uh that type of stuff and but you can recover in a couple of days from a, from a, uh, donating a pint of blood and and i think most of your people do as uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure many firefighters donate willingly to the blood banks which is critically short you need to but uh, uh what i would do is if you come back with a high pfas level maybe don't donate that blood to the blood bank but still draw it and just discard it and that's sort of a, a self-remedy um don't tell any doctors you're not doing this but they they should certify that you're of good enough health to able to be able to lose a pint of blood every now and then. Mm -hmm. But that would be, that's sort of a mechanical way of doing it. But geez, I'm not an MD, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to recommend that. But I think yeah. it's one of those, this is one of the things you could explore with an MD and say, look, how do I get these levels down? And well, is 20 really dangerous? Well, we know that for every doubling of the, the number that we see in the blood, the immune system generally drops by a half as well. So they did this study on vaccine effectiveness in school children. And um, 
every time they doubled the blood concentration of, of PFAS. Just they didn't. Uh, the students just came in, some with high, some with low, and the high ones had less uh, immune response to the, the vaccines they were given. And so uh, applying that wide release really says that these are immunotoxins and you don't really want them in your blood. Uh, so those, those are the sort of things why we want to do that uh, before anybody takes drastic action. If it's just, you, if you double the national average, oh well, that's, that's what we sort of live with and it'll come back down in a few years. Um, if you know you've handled a triple F a lot, um, military firefighters have in particular, uh, then they will probably be more elevated than that. And I've, I've known several people with high elevations, but, um, there are people living up in Grand Rapids, never been a firefighter in their life that have really high levels too, because they lived on a contaminated water supply. So um, what was the name of that company that you do the $300 test? Pick the, the yeah, it's called, it's a commercial lab called Eurofins USA. Uh-huh. So E-U-R-O-F-I-N-S uh, USA. And that's the USA branch of this multinational uh, testing corporation. And they developed it. They, they actually, I know the guy who developed it there and he's, he's very good. And so um, they charge, you can, uh, sign up online and for pay three hundred dollars, they'll send you a kit and it has instructions how to pick your finger, send the card, and send it back. They do a bunch of blood tests that way these days, a capillary pin trick, and this is pretty accurate. I hear. I, I think they do a pretty good job on it. I'm gonna look into that. That's that's. Yep. I mean, right? Like right now, we have to have some kind of, we have to have some kind of control of what we're in, right? And so yep. having being able to control uh, our, our exposure, uh, getting getting our regular checkups. You know, we know what we uh, what types of cancers in the fire service uh, seem to prosper more than any other place. Uh, yep. So we have to start. We have to make sure we have a good relationship with our doctor. Go to the, uh, get our physicals as much as as much as we can. Uh, look into these other alternatives, like you just mentioned with the the test. Although I'd rather spend eight hundred dollars because just you know, I got that kind of money. I can do that. I can afford it. <laughs> I, I don't want to brag. I don't want to flex, but I kind of pulled yeah, yeah, seventy six yeah. last year. That's a lot of money. No. <laughs> I, I really sure. appreciate your time on here today, sir. No, uh, thank really you for the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Well, no, I, I really I want to help get the message out that we need to be aware of this. And there's, there are things we can do. It's not doom and gloom. There are things that we can take control of right now. Yep. And that's, I was a little worried that I was going to get a doom and gloom vibe by the end of this simply because I'm, I'm really nervous about this stuff, but I actually, mm-hmm. I don't, I really, I feel better. There's knowledge. Uh, there's power in just the knowledge, knowing that it's there exactly. and what we can do. Uh, before I go though, I do, I, I remember one more thing about you. That, uh, I told you about my wife. She said, I, I damn it. I, I gave you that before you yep. saw this. Well, actually I forgot to tie it in on the third piece. Uh, there is a fire, uh, a chief in Hanover. It's a friend of mine, Chris Hubbard. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Many months ago, he sent me uh, the uh, where you talked at FDIC. He said, "Hey, this yep. would be a great guy for your podcast." Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of Chris and always, you know. But somehow, I just kind of lost that. So when my wife told me, reminded me how what an idiot I was, and that she's already tell me that stuff, it got me thinking. And I remember, and I found Chris's text, and it was you. Right. Uh So it was the Holy Trinity, you know, my boss wife and then, you know, Chris and then finding you on the Internet. uh, This this was meant to happen. So I appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate the information. And I will say this. I want to come back. You said nobody asked you back. I'm going to ask you back because I want to see in the next six months to a year where we're at in the fire service with PFAS based on what you've Mm -hmm. been because you're doing more studies. You're doing more. uh, You're learning more stuff. So I definitely am going to have to come back. Yep, we are definitely going after a few other things, which will be of interest to the fire services. So we'll we'll let you know when we have that, and sure, I'll be happy to. If you can roll you, out Jake. beer having it, that'd be great. If you could just go ahead and do a test and just do that, that'd be uh, awesome. Now, to my knowledge, scotch is all fine. <laughs> there you go. There's always a plan B, brother. There's, There's always, always plan, plan B. B. There you go. Thank you so much for your time, doctor. Take care. And it's been an absolute thrill. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Our podcast today was sponsored by Fire Facilities. This Made in America company is dedicated to constructing top quality custom training structures to meet your needs. Make your training count with all steel structures that are made to last. Visit firefacilities.com for more details.